Thank you so much. Wow, what a treat to be here. Um, it, it really is a treat to be here. So I got interested in medicine and decided I, I would try to pursue a career in medicine. But I also was really interested in sort of policy and public health and why were we having these disparities um, in the United States where we're literally a mile apart um, we had the, the one of some of the wealthiest communities and best, um, best performing schools and some of the worst. So I'm going to talk about both of those things and the opportunity that you have here to do something about them. Don Berwick talks about this, this dual challenge we have of healthcare that does amazing things for people and so many people left out. And to come to St. Louis, to Ferguson, Michael Brown, thinking about the ways our systems have created um, discrimination, isolation, we need to think really differently if we're going to make healthcare better. I am incredibly excited about what we see happening in healthcare. This possibility that the redesign of new models of care can get us to places where patients are getting much better care is what I see happening and is somewhat challenging. The health system is failing our children. This need not be so. Payment and delivery reform are essential and could accelerate innovation in both care and technology. But important barriers to success need to be thought about. The, the, there are basically four things that come out of the model that have to be done if you're to make this successful. One is to adopt global payment in some form. Bundled payments, global payment for accountable care organizations or something like that that takes the total cost of care and makes a group of providers accountable for it. And you have to mitigate the volume-based, you fundamentally have to mitigate the volume-based incentives that are in our system and give people incentives to improve care, to improve care, not just cut, not to achieve it by rationing, but to improve care by, to lower costs by improving care. And I think we're seeing more and more examples of how it's about improvement that allows you to lower costs. Um, you have to support and spread innovation and improvement in care delivery. You have to implement population health improvement programs. Some of those are really expensive. Early childhood education, poverty reduction programs. They are really expensive, but when you put those together, so you reinvest some of the savings from all of these programs in those community-based and clinical programs, that's when you can fully implement these programs and a realistic assumption about how much money it takes and get, get the payoffs that I showed you in the prior slide. We also looked at outcomes, quality, physicians' perceptions of quality, and there was no evidence that more was better on any of the measures we had. Physicians in the higher spending regions actually said in surveys that we did, it's harder to provide, high, they were more likely to say, I can't provide high quality care here. The key thing about spending isn't that we want to spend less, that could cause harm. We want to think carefully about how we spend our money. What are we spending it on? Are we spending it on making sure people get the care they need, the right medications, no more than the right medications, not 26 medications, the right eight or 10, you know, that they get the right care at the right time at the right place. So this, these are some really important insights. It's about how you spend the money. And there are, there are real opportunities for savings. So this is, we've just ranked in the most recent data, hospital referral regions, there are 306 of them in the United States, and looked at inpatient, how much time people spend in the inpatient setting across the United States. And you'll see St. Louis there marked um, inpatient day rate of about 1.36 per patient. That means every Medicare patient spends about, on average, 1.36 days in the hospital in a year. But what you see from this slide is that there are substantial opportunities to reduce the utilization of hospitals if we take the lowest spending regions as benchmarks. And if for the country as a whole, we would save 31% of our days in the hospital if we could all get to those benchmarks. People started to understand the waste in American healthcare. You know, Don Berwick estimates 30, 30 to 40% savings. I'm, our estimates were 30%. That's a lot of money. So that all led, this consensus that there are huge opportunities for improvement, led us to say two things as a country. One is we can afford to expand access. We do not need to have 50 million people uninsured in this country, which is a, a scandal. We can say, all right, let's expand insurance. Let's expand coverage. Let's make sure if you're poor, you don't have to go to bed scared. Um, but let's also redesign care. So the big pieces of the Affordable Care Act were this 
investment and expansion, but also this effort, kind of hard to do, to change the way we pay for health care and to have delivery systems pay attention to improving care and lower costs. As you think about the incentives under fee-for-service, it's about doing more, it's about volume. The focus of responsibility is just that specific encounter, whether it's a nursing home stay or a physician visit. And the locus of accountability is the individual clinician or facility. Now that leads to fragmented care. And so the, actually the other motivation for health reform was in fact this sense that the degree of fragmentation that patients experience and who's responsible for their care and how does information get from one place to another, the fragmentation that patients were experiencing was awful. What does value mean? This shift to value is, I think, really important for us to think about. Um, Gene Nelson and Paul Batalden, leaders of quality improvement um, in the country, Paul helped found the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, came up with this notion of, of the value compass which has four domains. Functional status, how does the patient feel? What are they able to do? Um, clinical outcomes, mortality, morbidity, the clinical stuff that we as uh, clinicians look at in terms of how patients are doing. Um, satisfaction against need, that is what was the experience that the patient had? Did they feel cared for? Um, but also, critically important in there is what were their goals? Were we actually paying attention to meeting their goals? And then fourth, of course, the total cost of care. So if the key notions in this model uh, are that it is, value is multidimensional. And if we don't think about all dimensions, we're going to make mistakes. Judgment is required. One thing we know about biomedical innovation, and the evidence has been great, is that it tends to be outcome improving. That graph is going up. But it also tends to be cost increasing. And the research is pretty strong on that. Innovations in care delivery offer a double win. Um, they offer the opportunity to improve care and lower costs. And let me give you a couple of examples. So Iora Health is a new, prim new model of primary care. Very using new technologies. Um, they've developed their own electronic health record. Anyone working with a, a, a traditional electronic health record designed around billing, Iora's is designed around the patient. Um, wonderful technology. Health coaches is a powerful tool for improving care. That's a picture of a health coach with his patient. Um, very radical innovation in primary care that, that moving to a new payment model enables. A new model of specialty care. Sanjeev Arora, a gastroenterologist in, in New Mexico, realized that care for patients with hepatitis C across the state were pathetic. Um, people had to drive six hours. Their outcomes were terrible. He said, what if we used clinical protocols to educate um, and give a decision tree to every clinician in the state? And then I'm available Friday afternoons by Skype to answer questions where there are uncertainties. They were able to achieve um, outcomes better than most gastroenterology practices in the United States. Adherence to evidence, helping us at the front lines make wise decisions. So if I were giving you some thoughts about what you might do, I'd have you thinking about building stronger collective governance. Strengthen the collaborative commitment to regional stewardship. You know, why not freeze health facility construction in this region? Just right now. You probably don't have the power in this room to do it, but you have friends who could. You know, why not establish a regional cap and trade program from hospital beds? Manage physician supply. There are not many places in the country that have the data that you have put together in this community that can monitor the way we're doing, show how much discretionary care is being used, feed it back to providers and say, hey, let's try to do better. So Corey Kruger, um, physician at Billings Clinic, one of the most successful physician group practice demonstration places, um, was going around um, talking to docs about you know, what their quality improvement program was like and how they were trying to do stuff. And the neurologist said, Kruger, Kruger, I know that name. You're in charge of that quality improvement program, aren't you? He said, yes. He said, you're the reason we're having enough, so much trouble enrolling patients in our stroke trials, because our patients aren't having strokes anymore. <laughs> what do you think Corey said? Make my day. You know, why are we here? Judy Rich, a nurse. Pa Pal Evans, a physician in Tucson, the first place that declared itself to be an accountable care organization. 
pal said early into, you know, a couple of years ago, this is the first time in my life where I've felt that there's hope for medicine, where we're able to pay attention to doing the things that really matter to us. The key insight is that um, I, I agree, I think you probably have about 30% of your hospital utilization that's avoidable. Mm -hmm. um, and the narrow definitions of avoidable care that are out there miss the mark tremendously. So ARC patient safety indicators, which you guys are using, are such a narrow swath of the potentially avoidable care. Because patients with cancer getting chemotherapy, they might be happier doing it as an outpatient and, being, and actually be safer at home, for example. <laughs> Um, so, yes, you have a tremendous opportunity here. And, Thank you. and, you know, this notion, why not an immediate freeze on hospital construction? You know, why not get everybody to figure out, you know, figure out how to manage that capacity? And the only people who can do that are the large businesses who bring the hospitals together and bang heads and say, I'm sorry, guys, we're not, you know, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to tolerate um, wasteful inpatient care. So the challenge with high deductible health plans is that they influence patients in their decisions about the stuff that, where they have choice. Um, they don't influence care where it's really expensive. You know, once you've hit, you know, once you're in the hospital, you've gone past any element where a high deductible plan is going to influence your decisions, or you've gone past it in a year. So they do two things. One is they don't slow health care costs, because if you look at that supply sensitive stuff I was talking about, hospitals can stay perfectly busy on a smaller and smaller subset of the population that's still in their, you know, in the inpatient setting. Um, and there's plenty of work, there are plenty of sick patients um, for us to take care of as clinicians. So the second thing they do, is, so they don't slow health care spending, and we've seen that, you know, oh, yes, you can look at the segment that's got a high deductible health plan. But you look at the community level and there's been no deflection. No deflection in total health care spending because the rest of us can stay busy. The second thing they do is they undermine any effort to do primary care or accountable care where it's a population health program and, physician, and patients will try to stay away from those primary care programs. So if you look at California's exchange, what they did was they, they require plans listed on the exchange to have almost no deductibles for primary care visits for many of them. Then they put the weight of the deductibles on the elective expensive stuff like the $5,000 MRI. So both, you've raised a wonderful set of questions. <laughs>